Thank you very much. Morning, everyone. So my job is actually the same thing, to ask you to take your seats. Um, and we come back all refreshed from last night's uh, presentation where we covered the, the gambit from um, the end of the bimetallic system in 1870 to which is the real football, and, and that was a wide spectrum. We've kind of designed the program the same way, uh, so I won't belabor the point. We've organized things in five sessions. Uh, we're going to start with some of the more sort of immediate and perhaps technical issues and then move out to some of the more wide spectrum long-term sessions towards the end of the day and tomorrow. So with no further ado, because I assume you've seen the program and had a chance to look at the background documentation, I'll turn it over to my friend and colleague, Jim Haley. Jim? Great. Thank you very much, uh, Ro Hinton, and welcome to all of the uh, participants, all the panelists. Uh, my job, I think, as chair is to uh, really facilitate a good discussion amongst the panelists, and I hope we have that this morning. I'm sure we will. Uh, they are all distinguished in their fields. I don't propose to, to go over their biographies and provide formal introductions. Uh, you have the, their, the, the information in front of you. Um, and let me just begin, however, by trying to motiv little, motivate a little uh, a bit uh, the, the conference and particularly the title. I hope that you find the title slightly enigmatic uh, five years after the fall. Um, the fall of what uh, may come to your mind? Is it uh, the fall of finance, the lords of finance that, that ruled prior to the crisis? Uh, is it the fall of the conventional economic thinking that prevailed prior to the crisis? Is it the fall of the dominance, uh, the leadership of the G7 advanced economies and uh, which, which now, I, I would argue, are suffering somewhat from uh, a loss of cachet. The, the, the cachet of their leadership has been sl slightly tarnished. But there's also, I think, uh, some theological overtures, uh, overtones to the title, the fall. Clearly in Judeo-Christian uh, religion, there's the fall from grace. And in this respect, uh, perhaps what we, uh, we may want to think about is uh, the fall of long-term thinking. And perhaps prior to the crisis and leading up to the crisis, there was too much focus on the immediate, on the near term. And that is one theme that I have tried to, uh, to articulate in the background paper that I wrote, um, that we are in a very difficult situation with very large adjustment burdens uh, around the world, and that to find a good, sensible, sustainable solution to those adjustment burdens will take medium-term, longer-term thinking, and that will impose, I think, a, a discipline, a require discipline of our policymakers. We are, I think, um, in a very difficult situation, and I should preface anything I say further by saying that the views that I hold and uh, that uh, any comments that I make are of my own. They are not, uh, do not reflect the views of the Inter-American Development Bank or the Government of Canada or anyone other than myself. And frankly, I'm not sure I even uh, <laughs> would even uh, <laughs> adhere to them if, yeah, on sober second thought. So, so I ask you to uh, please bear that in mind. But having said that, um, as I say, we are in a very difficult situation. Um, the latest IMF World Economic Outlook has pointed to a marked slowdown uh, around the world and a synchronized slowdown. Uh, we have three key risks that uh, cloud the outlook. The first, of course, the continuing uncertainty, the continuing turbulence in the Eurozone and uh, concerns of whether, how, when, if Europe will be able to uh, resolve that very, very difficult and very troubling situation. The second, of course, the fiscal cliff in the United States. Uh, the, the election of uh, President Obama hopefully provides some prospect for a resolution, 
But of course, the uh, political fissures and the cleavages in Congress remain. The election, I forget the amount of money that was spent on the U.S. election, but uh, it returned, in effect, the status quo. So that remains a very serious issue. And the IMF staff also identified a third risk in the wheel, and that is uh, the potential for much higher uh, oil prices uh, arising from geopolitical tensions. So big risks ahead, big risks to confront, and unfortunately, I think the crisis has bequeathed a number of legacies that will make it very difficult indeed to address these risks. And to some extent, these, these legacies reflect the fact that the crisis has morphed over time. It started in the summer of uh, 2007, five years ago, a little more than five years ago, as a financial crisis. By the fall of 2008, it had transformed itself from a financial crisis or a crisis in the financial sector to a crisis in the real economy. And we all know, we remember very clearly, I'm sure, the extent to which output, employment, and trade all fell off the cliff. Uh, in those very troubling, very dark days of uh, September, October 2008. Of course, there was a policy response. The G20 leaders met in Washington in November of 2008. They met again in London in April 2009. They met in Pittsburgh in September 2009. And arguably, they met the extraordinary circumstances with, ex with an extraordinary response. And as I say in the paper, they heeded the three key lessons of the Great Depression. First, monetary policy provided liquidity when it was needed. Second, there was a fiscal policy response that ensured that fiscal policy did not, did not turn pro-cyclical as it had in the, arguably in the Great Depression. And finally, G20 leaders resisted the natural temptation to impose restrictions on trade uh, and impose protection to preserve employment at home at the expense of shifting the, the burden abroad. Those extraordinary responses averted another Great Depression, but they have, as I say, bequeathed a number of legacies. And those legacies themselves uh, in, will, I think, going forward, make it difficult to address the risks in the, in the global economy and move from a path of uncertainty to a path of sustainable long-term growth. So the crisis, as I say, has, has morphed from a financial crisis to a crisis of the real economy, and the danger going ahead is that it transforms itself from a crisis of the real economy to a crisis of political economy, as governments around the world, facing enormous adjustment burdens, opt to pursue a path of uh, independence, autonomy, of in, of in effect shifting the burden of adjustment to others, uh, had, as had been the case in the, in the 1930s. To avoid that, we need cooperation and arguably, it is the, G20 role, the G20's role to provide that cooperation. But it is much more difficult today to get the cooperation needed, simply because we're no longer facing the common threat. We have economies at different conjunctural positions requiring different policy settings, and in that world, it is much more difficult, I would argue, to get the cooperation that's needed. All of this leads to a world of great uncertainty, and it, and it will require uh, enormous foresight and, as I say, medium -term, a medium-term perspective. So to help us address these questions, we have uh, five very good panelists, and 
the purpose of this panel is to stimulate a, a good discussion and have a good discussion amongst the panelists. And I propose to do that by going around the table, asking for a five minute quick intervention. That will be followed by a give and take among the panelists. And then we will open it up to the floor and take pan uh, questions or comments from the floor. So after long and profound thought, we've arrived at a order and that will begin with uh, John Williamson on my right. And as I say, I'm not going to introduce all of the panelists. They are well known to you all, uh, except to say, John, uh, welcome to CG and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about the three short-term issues that I think confront the G20. Uh, which are indeed the issues that Jim Haley just outlined. Uh, first of all, the, let me treat them, however, in a somewhat different order, <coughs> starting with the U.S. fiscal cliff. Uh, I, I don't think last night it was suggested that the world face also an environmental and equity cliffs. And I don't think that's right. Um, environment, we, we essentially, the, the best chance of confronting the environmental threat without uh, disruption was passed over 20 years ago by the U.S. Congress. And uh, there were no consequences for 20 years, and then we've had it. In another 20 years, we shall have regular standards, and then people will begin to worry about climate change. But they're not worried at the moment, so there's no cliff. There's nothing forcing a decision. And the same thing, I th think, is true with equity. In the case of fiscal cliff, it, it is for it forces a decision um, it, exactly because of the, there's a prospect of a, a recession if we don't do something about it. Uh, I, whether the G20 is uh, lecturing to the US will accomplish anything very much, I doubt. Um, personally, I, I'm in favor of going over the fiscal cliff. I think it uh, offers the probably the best chance of uh, getting uh, U.S. taxes to, ri to rise on people who can afford to pay. And if the price of that is of a short-term recession, so much the worse. But uh, I think it's probably worth the price worth paying. Let me secondly uh, turn to the euro crisis. I think also that one could take the attitude that uh, the G20 is unlikely to have much impact on the euro crisis. It's essentially a German, uh, Germany that calls the shots in Europe. Um, it's clearly not a um, uh, Germany has not proved to be an enlightened citizen in this regard. It uh, pursues wrong policies. But uh, I don't think that there is very much prospect of that of being altered by G20 preaching. Um, th to give the Germans credit, they are, do, um, they are willing to pull sovereignty in a way that other countries aren't, and which I think would uh, be an essential aspect of overcoming the crisis. <clears throat> the third... Uh, issue is that of rebalancing. And uh, here I, I think that the G20 is in a good position, in fact, to uh, give a lead. It, uh, all the countries are, that are involved are represented, unlike in the G8, where it was a case of preaching to the Chinese who were outside the group. And so there's a big advantage in having a G20 rather than a G8 uh, from this point of view. Um, there's, uh, secondly, there's, uh, this is a readily comprehensible subject which leaders can understand and can be expected to understand. And I think that sets it aside from, for example, regulation, where I agree that also there's a need for them to call on others to undertake negotiations, but I don't think that they themselves would are likely to contribute much in the way of negotiation. But in the case of uh, the, the uh, rebalancing, that clearly is an international bargain to be struck. Is it likely to be stuck? No, I fear not, because uh, the Chinese have dug in their heels, the U.S. has dug in its heels, and uh, it is quite unlikely to be. Uh, but at least it's, it's a possibility that uh, I think bears uh, consideration that this is a subject that is ideally suited for the G20, and if it doesn't come to a conclusion on this, I don't think we have 
can have very much hope of its future. Thank you very much, John. I'll now turn to Stephen. Uh, Stephen Pickford, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, and thanks for the invitation uh, to this, this temple of uh, whiskey making. <laughs> um, you, in advance of this, uh, you said you wouldn't mind having stirring up a bit of controversy. Uh, I suspect uh, John's already done that by, uh, by saying we should go over the fiscal cliff. Um, I'm going to try and do a little bit more also on the European side. Um, <coughs> I mean, Europe is, is, is fascinating at the moment. Um, I suppose even more fascinating if you don't live there. Um, but the, uh, it, it's clearly a huge global problem and a global risk um, because Europe is, what, 25% of the global economy. Um, Europe as a whole um, saw a GDP loss of 5% uh, in 2009. Uh, the core has just about recovered that loss, the Euro core. Uh, the Euro periphery has, has fallen some more. Uh, the UK has also, uh, is, is much more peripheral-like in that respect. And the forecasts are terrible. If you look at the IMF forecasts and you treat them with a pinch of salt, um, but for 2012 and 2013 together, they're forecasting Italy minus 3%, Spain minus 3%, Portugal minus 4%, Greece minus 10%. And this is, off, this is on top of the falls that have already happened. And without uh, fully incorporating any risk of the euro crisis worsening. So this matters. Uh, it matters for the rest of the world because of the linkages, both the trade and the financial linkages. Um, but it's also fascinating because the, uh, I think the way in which policy cooperation or coordination is practiced in Europe um, uh, may have some lessons, uh, some good, some bad lessons uh, for wider cooperation. Um, and it's there that I think the European policymakers have, have, have really concentrated. Uh, and it's, 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 I think, instructive to look at some of those uh, developments. Um, I mean, there, there have been immediate responses to the crisis. Uh, the ECB has been very active in terms of providing liquidity. The, the latest move, the, um, the OMT, uh, provides essentially unlimited uh, liquidity. The, after many, many false starts, um, the, Euro, the EU has some firewalls in place in terms of protecting, uh, protecting countries in crisis. The IMF have got involved. Um, conditionality has been increased, um, which we can argue about whether it's a good or a bad thing. Um, but at least there is some program in place. And there's a whole program of financial regulatory reform as, as short-term responses. But there's also been a big push in terms of looking at the governance structures um, which I think were rightly identified as, as being a big structural cause of the crisis, uh, especially in the euro area. So you've had the two-pack, you've had the six-pack, you've had a fiscal treaty, uh, which uh, still hasn't been uh, implemented. Um, you now have talk of a banking union, a single regulatory mechanism, uh, common... Uh, uh, deposit guarantee schemes, you have a single rule book for financial regulation. All of these um, are changing the architecture of decision making within Europe. Um, and the, in, in three important respects, I would argue. One, there's much greater centralization of decision making. It's being concentrated in institutions which are further and further away from the nation state. Um, you can, different people will have different views about whether this is a good or a bad thing, but essentially more and more decision making will be taken by the ECB, uh, which is very, very independent, uh, by the Commission, which is, I would argue, quasi-independent. You have now 
supervisory authorities, super and supervisory authorities, which have a great deal of power and are not really accountable to anybody. Um, so you've got that move. The second thing is you've got a move towards a much greater set of rules uh, on fiscal policy, on financial regulation, um, a whole structure of rules which are, which are intended to constrain the, uh, um, the, the room for maneuver at the national level and backed up by the third thing, which is a whole raft of sanctions against bad behavior. And this is an interesting model because you're effectively putting in place um, a super state, I would argue, without much in the way of dem democratic accountability. The parliament is basically toothless. Um, uh, the council of uh, member states is was driving decision making, uh, not, a, not in a very effective fashion. Um, but is the commission going to be any better? Uh, does the ECB, which is independent of nations and central bank governors are, are there, who are, again, with all due respect, Gordon, unelected, um, uh, is that a good model for, for uh, concentrating decision-making power. So there are some big, big issues uh, in terms of the structure of governance, uh, which is, has the very lofty ideal of trying to improve coordination and cooperation of policymaking, um, but is that a good model for people to follow? Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Stephen. And I think you have indeed stirred the pot somewhat. Um, we'll turn to, uh, to Jorgen uh, now, um, coming from the OECD, you're, as, as Stephen said, Europe is, is fascinating, probably more fascinating for people outside of Europe than in, but you're coming from Paris and the OECD, so uh, I'm sure you are uh, well, well versed in the issues and I look forward to your, your comments, thanks. Thank you. Uh, one feature that's common to the global economy, which John spoke about, and uh, to the euro area economy, which Stephen spoke about, is that uh, you need economic rebalancing. Uh, and uh, basically what, uh, what I would intend to do here is to, to make the case for thinking seriously about the role that structural policy can do for or can play for uh, economic uh, rebalancing. I think we as, uh, as macroeconomists, when, when we think about uh, rebalancing, we have a tendency to think about it in terms of macroeconomic uh, policies and, and macroeconomic variables. And then uh, after having discussed that, we, we throw in sort of the, the token paragraph at the end uh, saying, uh, oh, and by the way, we need some structural reforms. Uh, and, and what we have in mind there, if we, if we think about it at all, uh, is uh, that uh, structural reform, well, that's good for uh, growth of supply. Um, and I certainly don't, don't want to belittle that. Uh, uh, higher growth is, is certainly good for welfare. It's, uh, it's uh, also good for, for uh, debt dynamics, which is important these days. But basically what I would uh, like to argue is that uh, uh, structural reforms can be very important for rebalancing of, uh, rebalancing of demand. Uh, and, and that is necessary both in uh, the euro area and uh, the global economy uh, at large. I think more, more specifically uh, structural reforms affect patterns of, uh, of saving and uh, investment. Um, now the difficulty is, of course, that structural policies are such a mixed bag. Uh, I mean, all kinds of measures affecting all kinds of, uh, of markets, uh, very, very hard to, to uh, uh, get a, 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 a sense of. I think that's actually one of the reasons why we think so little about their role in, in rebalancing, that uh, it's just so unwieldy. Um, we've done some work uh, at the OECD on, on how different classes of structural reforms could help to uh, bring about uh, rebalancing. But just to provide a, a, a couple of examples, uh, things like uh, improving healthcare insurance actually turns out to be uh, 
pretty important for private saving behavior. I mean, precautionary saving would be affected, uh, uh, I think, would, would be one of the, the channels. Now, think about that in the context where an, a, a chronic excess uh, supply, uh, excess saving country like China uh, is going to continue to improve its healthcare insurance uh, going forward. This, this, this could be important. I'm not sure. Well, I'm sure the Chinese are not improving the healthcare for the sake of rebalancing, but for the sake of uh, Chinese citizens. But, but, but still, um, I think uh, financial reform is, is another uh, case. Uh, for, for a lot of the world, the reality in the financial sector is not overly lax regulation. For a lot of the world, uh, the situation in financial markets is actually still financial repression. And uh, I think uh, the, the evidence tends to show that uh, if you liberalize, of course I'm not arguing for, for uh, reckless uh, liberalization, but, but, but if you liberalize uh, in a considered manner, then that will tend to, to reduce uh, excess saving. Uh, the empirical evidence also suggests that um, uh, tight regulation on a range of uh, service sectors, such as you have it in Germany or Japan, uh, is uh, something that's associated with a higher saving surplus. Uh, the mechanism may be that uh, by constraining the service sector, you sort of squeeze resources into the exposed sector of, uh, of the economy. And I think on, on that basis, uh, Germany could actually make a meaningful contribution to euro area rebalancing by, uh, by finally undertaking some of the, uh, uh, the reforms that they probably should have done for their own sake uh, for many, many years ago, but, uh, but still haven't gotten around to. And, and, and likewise, I think uh, labor market reforms should be good for labor market reforms in the peripheral uh, your area countries should be good for, for, for rebalancing. Um, I, these, these are just some, some, some examples, uh, but, but we have taken these and, and, and similar uh, uh, estimates to see whether we could identify packages of reform across countries that could make a meaningful impact on, on, on rebalancing. And uh, uh, the option is, yes, this is actually something that generates a first order effect. I mean, in, in terms of, of uh, impact on imbalances, the, the, the effects of structural policy are on a par with the kind of uh, effects that you would get from necessary fiscal consolidation. So it's big. Uh, now that, that still, of course, leaves the question of, uh, uh, whether G20 will, will be able to, to rise to that challenge. In, in, in some sense, you could say uh, structural reforms are probably among the most domestic of all policies that, that you can imagine. And, and uh, uh, there, will, there will clearly be, be some issues as to whether G20 can, can get into, into that. Uh, still, they are on the G20 agenda. It has been decided that uh, one wants to enhance accountability for, for, for structural reform. I think there is a bit of hope there. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Jorgen. I'll turn now to Mark Thurwell. Uh, Mark from Australia has perhaps a slightly different perspective. You're probably the furthest removed from, from Europe. So, so over to you. Thank you, and um, thanks for the opportunity to be here again. Uh, look, I thought I'd talk about two things. Um, and particularly from the perspective of what we've learned over the last five years, um, I think you know, two big lessons are about convergence and divergence. Um, convergence is perhaps the, the biggest one, and this is, of course, the, the old and, you know, I guess, almost tiresomely familiar story now about the rise of emerging markets. Um, and again, if we think just you know, five or maybe a little bit more than that years ago, for example, China's contribution to global growth was still a fraction of that of the United States, whereas this year and next year, it's expected to be a multiple. Um, we live in a world of new, of new growth poles, and you know, coming from Australia, that's particularly obvious to us, where when we look at the, our growth correlations, there's been a very marked shift between you know, what drives our growth and where it comes from. 
And you know, one of the, uh, the most concrete manifest and manifestations of that shift is, of course, the rise of the G20 itself. You know, one big reason that we have a G20 as opposed to the old G7, G8 is this change in the geography of economic growth. But that's kind of the old lesson. The sort of the, the, the slightly newer and, and somewhat more worrying lesson is what's been happening to emerging market growth over the last year or so. And we've seen a very marked slowdown, um, including in China, but not restricted there. We've seen very soft growth out of India, very soft growth out of Brazil. Um, and then suddenly we've sort of seen these question marks coming back over, well, what's the actual longer term trajectory of emerging markets? Um, do we have to rethink a, a convergence model against this backdrop of a very weak developed economy world in a world where the US and the Eurozone and the EU more broadly are growing more weakly? Um, does that just mean, is the convergence coefficient, if you like, the same and it's just that the catch up growth at the frontier, the, the growth at the frontier is slower? Or in a world where, global, where the global frontier is doing much more badly, does the catch up coefficient change? Is, is this a world that it's actually harder to deliver catch up growth in? Um, and we're seeing this debate, for example, in terms of the Chinese growth trajectory. People are now talking about an L-shaped China growth trajectory, the end of double-digit growth in China, a slower kind of growth rate going forward. And it seems to me, if you're thinking about the big picture global growth story, um, while it's very important to get your views right on what happens to US policy, what happens to the future of the Eurozone, it's at least as important and arguably even more so to figure out what's the underlying story here about emerging markets. Is this a cyclical downturn because the world looks not so good or is there something interesting and important going on structurally? And I think linked to that one, there's this int there's a sort of a related and very important question and this comes back partly to the G20 as well about emerging market resilience in the face of these negative external shocks. I think it's plausible to make the case that the resilience that emerging markets showed to the global financial crisis and the current degree of resilience is mostly about domestic policy settings within those economies. It's about the large degrees of self-insurance that they've taken, often to a great deal of criticism when countries haven't liked these big builds up in foreign exchange reserves. It's about somewhat repressed domestic financial systems. It's about caution on exchange rates and capital flows. Um, and it's not very much about changes in international policy settings. Um, it's not the case, I think, if you look out across the world economy, that we've radically made the world safer for emerging markets, despite the lessons of the last five years. It seems to me that's an interesting challenge going forward. If we want to maintain the convergence story, and that's very important for global growth, is there more we can do at the international policy setting, or do we default back to saying, well, it's basically still up to these economies themselves? Um, Parallel to convergence, we've also had this big story of divergence. And I'll, I'll only talk about this quickly because we, we touched on it a lot last night, but um, that story of rising inequality across not every country, it's not a completely global phenomenon, but across many countries seems to be an important one. Um, it's a pre-crisis trend. It's potentially a contributory factor to the crisis, this linkage between inequality and debt buildups. And it's also increasingly um, evidence of a, a response to the crisis in terms of where the burdens of adjustment fall. So when we're thinking, for example, about political and social sustainability of our current trajectory of the world economy, I think we have to come back to the, the phrase that was used last night, the inequality cliff. Um, whether it's a, it's a cliff or not, there's a, I think you, you can argue about, but it's a, it's a pretty clear trend and it's one that I think has significant implications for the sustainability of policy adjustment. Um, we're asking a question about who's going to pay for the policy mistakes that were made in the past and how you distribute that. And getting that question wrong, it seems to me, has important implications for things like international trade policy, for the ability of governments to, to deliver on these sort of on, on more broad international cooperation. It's also, I think, a really interesting case study of the limitations of international cooperation. So, for example, if you think about um, inequality and a taxation policy response to it, you're one of the areas where you say, well, this is an, an, almost an obvious area for international cooperation. Um, if you're worried about taxing very mobile labor or very mobile capital, obvious solution to that, international coordination about what you do with tax bases and tax rates. How many people think that is a realistic policy scenario for the G20 or for anybody else to agree on? I suspect it will be a vanishingly small number. We'll think that, that you might think it's a good idea, but as a realistic one, it's very small. So as a result of which, we're likely to get quite biased policy adjustments because we rule out an awful lot of this stuff. And it seems grappling with what are the, the political realities of cooperation versus what that means for this, this divergence. Is, is, um, it's perhaps not quite at the top of the list the way the convergence story is, but it's not far off it, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And um, I think you just added uh, a much, much uh, food for thought for, for the audience. Um, our 
final uh, speaker in the first round is a uh, distinguished former central bank governor, but governor of uh, the Bank of Canada, Gordon Thiessen. Thanks, Jim. Well, going last means that there's nothing really left to say, is there? <laughs> One of the things I can't resist commenting on is that uh, this conference talks about the legacies of the financial crisis. And the thing we often turn to immediately are the U.S. fiscal cliff and the uh, European sovereign debt and banking situation. I happen to think that both of those involve such egregious failures of public policy that I don't really like to blame them on the, on the financial crisis. I mean, I think they stand by themselves as great as major failures. And I think this is giving them too much cover to say, well, this is just another of the legacies of the, uh, of the financial crisis. But what I really want to talk about uh, today uh, has already, again, been covered, because I wanted to express some skepticism about international coordination. And I think, basically, we expect too much out of the G20, but I think virtually, excuse me, all the speakers have expressed a kind of similar sense of what the limitation is. You know, in his note, if you read Jim Haley's note, he refers to the late Doug Purvis, who is an was an academic economist with a remarkable amount of insight into the analysis and construction of public policies. Jim, uh, while Jim didn't mention it particularly, it was probably there, but Doug differentiated between international policy coordination, which he did not favor because he didn't think it would work, and international policy cooperation, which he did favor, by which he really meant the exchange of information and analysis so that countries could better judge the international challenges that might need to be taken into account as they're making their domestic policy decisions. Indeed, I often found myself when the IMF came to Canada for its Article 4 consultations, we have a pretty sophisticated macro policy uh, institutions in Canada, and I'm thinking, these guys simply cannot spend the same amount of time on these issues as we can. And I don't know what kind of comparative advantage they bring to come to Canada and comment on it. And I'm sure that's probably true of a large number of other countries. Where I think they really can bring a benefit in those consultations is in talking about the international environment that an individual country faces and how it might respond to that with appropriate domestic policies. Now that goes back to Doug Purvis's international cooperation. Let's make sure that everybody is aware of the international circumstances they face and then the fund saying, well, given that, you really ought to be thinking about these kinds of adjustments to your domestic policy decisions. So by all means, let us have the G20 leaders discuss and exchange views about economic, uh, world economic issues. And this is particularly important right now when we've got these two major dysfunctional policy uh, situations in Europe and the US. But particularly when it comes to macro economic policy and to the extent that you want to talk about macroeconomic policy and international balance uh, issues. Don't hold your breath thinking that the G20 is ever going to be able to do anything to coordinate these things except in the most extreme circumstances. I mean obviously uh, November uh, 2008, April 2009 the situation was sufficiently serious. We thought we were about to get, go into a 1930s kind of uh, situation. The G20 can operate in those circumstances. But don't hold your breath waiting for them to coordinate now unless you think there's another serious crisis that is about to occur and will capture their, uh, their attention. There is a lot to do in exchange of information, but international policy coordination, I think we waste our time when we think about all the neat ways in which we could make that work. Thank you. <laughs>
Great. Well, thank you very much, Gordon, and thank you to all the panelists for uh, respecting the timelines. You've done a much better job than your chair. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I think we've, we've had some uh, very good uh, initial interventions. Um, I, I hope the, uh, the audience, members of the audience are thinking, uh, good questions and comments. We will go to them shortly. First, however, I want to just pick up on something that, Gordon, you've said in terms of the prospects for cooperation going forward. Um, unlikely unless we have another major downturn. And I guess my question to all of the panelists, what is the likelihood? How do you see that? Is there, I think the natural instinct will be to try and muddle through our current, our current situation. So if I could just go around the table quickly and just, what is your sense? Is a muddle through strategy likely to succeed? And perhaps we can just do it in the same order, John. If you want one year to answer, yes. I think it probably is the most likely outcome and uh, not, uh, neither a disaster nor anything we could take advice in. Um, yes, I, I think it's the most likely outcome. Uh, it's not a very attractive um, uh, prospect, but actually the, the next most likely prospect is a fairly disastrous uh, crisis. Um, uh, it's very, very difficult, I think, to to be op to see some some big upside risks at the moment. Um, and the problem with the muddle through uh, scenario is that it produces some big political strains. I mean, that's both within Europe, but but, but much more widely, because I think what what you the, the I think people can, ex can understand that in a crisis, living standards are squeezed, um, you know, times are hard, um, as long as there's some upside. But actually, if you carry on with a period, a sustained period of low growth, rising inequality, I think that produces some real political tensions, um, which, which actually in, in, in other ways could also generate some rather nasty downside scenarios. Well, let me concur that uh, model through is, uh, is the most likely, but not the only outcome. I think it's worth differentiating more than perhaps we've done so far between the two risks that we are, are concerned with, uh, the fiscal cliff and the euro area. I think the, the fiscal cliff is a finite risk. Uh, and well, obviously, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. But, but if it were to happen, it, it can be repaired. Uh, and I think all uh, studies of the impacts of the fiscal cliff would suggest that, uh, yes, it will have ramifications outside the U.S., but they are certainly very finite. Uh, by contrast, uh, the potential for the euro area to go bad in, in a big way is, is there, and the ramifications of that outside the euro area would be vastly bigger than uh, the ramifications of the fiscal cliff outside the U.S. Um, I think we have a, a natural bias when we're forecasting to go through uh, scenarios that look more or less what, like the one we're currently in, and that's why we all end up saying that muddle through is the one we're going to get. Um, and you know, my bias pushes me towards that too, but then taking that into mind, um, you know, I think we are living in a world economy which is subject to, um, to Murphy's Law and Finnegal's Corollary. You know, Murphy's Law, of course, is that if something can go wrong, it will. And Finnegal's Corollary is that if, it, if something can go wrong, it will, it will probably do so at the worst possible time. So um, I'm going to be even more pessimistic and say that, in fact, although my, <laughs> my natural instinct tells me to that, you know, as, a, as a sensible forecaster, I should go, through the muddle, go for the muddle through scenario, we'll probably get something worse. Well, I think the muddle through scenario is right, although I think Jorgen is right. Of the two, Europe is surely the most important. I mean, the U.S. situation, I think, again, the fiscal cliff is a kind of one-off. I'm sure they're going to find some way around that that kicks it forward. But even then, I mean, the U.S. as the, uh, as the world currency really has the luxury of carrying on with a large deficit to a degree that nobody else can. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be fixed. Uh, but in looking at the period ahead, it really is the European situation. 
that makes all the difference in the world. And uh, you just have to hope, as, as well as muddling through for a while, that each time they get a little bit of breathing room, there is some, some room forward. And I think there are some, some signs of progress there. We just have to hope that, uh, that they will continue and that some really hard decisions will be made, particularly in the European banking area. It seems to me that is so crucial that the rest of it just doesn't fall into place until you've got a well-capitalized banking system that is able to cope with the possibility of some debt restructuring in a few countries. Without that, the outlook really doesn't look good. Thank you. Stephen, two-handed. Yeah, I, I, I think Gordon's absolutely right. You need to strengthen the, the, the banks in Europe. Um, but to be honest, uh, at the pace of, of capital rebuilding that's envisaged, you can't afford to have uh, a big sovereign debt uh, restructuring or so sovereign debt crisis within the next few years. Uh, unfortunately, I suspect that we're not that far away from one. Um, and so you will, I think, be in the situation that um, uh, you end up, the financial implications go straight back onto the, the fiscal balance sheet. Um, and that then raises all the issues about burden sharing uh, between, between the countries, which is, which is at heart the big disagreement within Europe. Who's going to pay for this? Um, and, the pro and these are difficult issues, which is why they've muddled through. They've tried to muddle through. Um, and they'll continue to try to muddle through. Um, but the problem is also that each time they muddle through, uh, the, 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 um, the market, the favorable market response to every summit, and I think they're up to number 23 or something now, uh, the, the, the reaction has got shorter and shorter and shorter. So I think the last one, you know, the favorable response lasted less than two hours. Um, and so at some point, the, the, the market discipline uh, will, pr will probably precipitate the crisis, which is necessary for the fundamental decisions. But uh, it's not going to be a pain, it's not going to be a pain free process. Right, well, let's, let's just pursue this a little. Um, the way I look at Europe is in, in the context of Venn diagrams. And, you know, you say there is a set of policies that would work to resolve the crisis and move Europe back to a path of sustainable growth. And then there is a set of policies that are politically feasible. And unfortunately, those two sets, you know, define a null, there, there's a null set between those. Um, and while crisis, as Stephen says, the response time is getting shorter. And while it, as you get to the brink of a crisis, perhaps the set of policies that are politically feasible can shift closer to the policies that might work. Unfortunately, the closer you get to the crisis, the, sh the set of policies that would resolve the crisis also shifts. So it's, you're not, and I think this, is, this, this describes Europe over the last two years or three years, that they, there is just this basic fundamental issue. And Stephen, I think you You've highlighted it, uh, and it's very important for this, for CG, and that is there's governance failures of a massive, massive sort operating in Europe. And unless Europe can resolve those, uh, we're going to continue to have a source of instability. But what if Europe goes over the cliff? What then? I mean, my worry is that we have adopted extraordinary responses to the, the post-Lehman environment. Central banks have injected liquidity. They brought interest rates down to zero. They're now pumping out quantitative easing out of a massive scale. Fiscal policy did not turn pro-cyclical post-Lehman. But for many advanced economies, they, they are now reaching arguably the upper bound of their capacity to respond. So the question then is, if there is another Lehman-like shock originating in Europe, what and who can respond? What can be done and who, who, will, who will do it? I throw it open to the table. It's very obvious who could respond. It's China. Um, but uh, whether they will is not to talk there. And uh, if the G20 can encourage them, all the good. But uh, I, I don't uh, think it's so lightly.
I, I think the I think the problem also is that this uh, if if you get go if if Europe goes off the cliff, um, there are a lot of other things that change as a result. I mean, I don't think the 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 the, the underlying structure of Europe and decision making and the, the power, the, the levels of cooperation, or indeed the euro itself, uh, I don't think you can take those as givens anymore, in which case the whole, the whole world looks actually really rather different. I mean, because the, this is now no longer an economic, purely an economic crisis. This is, a, this is fundamentally a political crisis, which is the point that you were making earlier, Jim. Yeah. I mean, from looking at it from outside, it, it, it's actually pretty scary, right? I mean, it, it's clear that it's, an, it's now a failed experiment, but it's a failed experiment that's held together by the fact that the design of the, the whole thing is that exiting it is even more terrible than living with this almost terminally dysfunctional system. Um, but that's not a huge thing to hang all your hopes on. <laughs> and that's kind of where we're at, which is hence my somewhat pessimistic view. I mean, I, I guess I wanted to pick up t two other things. I mean, one, one that Stephen said and, and one that Gordon said. I mean, Stephen's point about, you know, the, the Eurozone solution to this stuff, which is to head gradually towards more integration, but to do so by basically pulling control away from the nation state and pulling it away from democratic accountability. Um, I mean, it seems to me it's, at one level, we know why that's the end game and why you almost have to do it. But it seems to me it's also a deeply unattractive model. We used to think of the Eurozone as this sort of potentially very attractive model for everybody else to look at. Um, economically, of course, that's no longer the case. But it seems to me that the political scenarios that you're sketching out make it look, starting to look very unattractive too. And I think why that's interesting and also worrying for the rest of us is because one of the big lessons, again, out of the last five years, is this age old, right? There's nothing new about this, but we all know about the disconnects between global or regional markets and national polities. And the problem has all been, how do you, how do you meld together a global market and, and, and the nation state? Um, and it looks like, for better or for ill, and it may not get there, but the Eurozone is sort of groping its way towards an answer to that question. Um, it, if it doesn't get there, it's really bad news for the rest of us. But if it gets there, it seems to me that the answer is not an attractive one, and that worries me too, because it, it says, well, basically, you get rid of, you, know, you, you shrink the democratic space, and you pull stuff off to a lot of unelected technocrats. You know, it's nice if you're a technocrat, it's not so nice for the rest of us. Um, uh, G Gordon's point, which sort of leaks into the Euro thing, was about you know, the nature of how, how dysfunctional policy settings have been recently. Um, in, in both in the Eurozone and also in the United States. And it's, again, it, and if you think about, again, this is a, a crisis legacy question too. Um, when you have countries in the G20, um, often the usual suspects, telling those countries that did, haven't had, yet had crises that this is what you should be doing for your policy response. So for example, telling Asia that this is the way you should be running your economy. Is it any surprise that Asian policymakers think, well, wait a minute, you know, do we really listen to you guys? Uh, is, is, uh, you're not doing a great job running your own economies. Is your policy advice really that sensible? And we should be heading right down these routes that you're telling us to. So it, it's probably not a surprise when we think that you know, if, if China or other regional economies are a bit cautious about taking the policy advice that's coming at them at the moment, you know, we shouldn't be surprised by that. On that, I think we should hear from someone representing the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Jorgen. Thank you for that. Um, let, let me just start with uh, Mark's uh, remark that uh, it is now clear that the euro is a failed uh, experiment. I, I would argue that uh, the jury is actually still out on, on, on that. Like, uh, the history of uh, European institutions has been that one has made a great leap forward uh, without thinking too much of the consequences, and then one has sort of subsequently uh, re repaired uh, the leaky roof, uh, the, 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 the basement and the foundations that, uh, that weren't right, uh, etc. And, and uh, if you want to, to be an optimist, you, you, you could argue that the euro area is, uh, is yet another case in point, uh, that uh, people knew full well back in the 90s uh, what they were, were, were heading into, but uh, they uh, expected, all right, when, when push comes to shove, uh, the foundations will actually uh, be, be, be repaired, and, and I'm, I'm not ready to, to, to totally concede uh, on, 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 on that uh, yet. Uh, now, uh, as to whether 
if Europe goes over the cliff, uh, or what the rest of the world can, can do, I think one has to recognize that, the, that Europe can go over the cliff in many different ways, uh, and, and, and different responses will be uh, required depending on, on, on how. But uh, uh, I, I think one thing that uh, is, is bound to, to happen in any such kind of scenario is that uh, the, uh, the set of politically possible policies is going to increase tremendously in, in all the, the countries outside Europe. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, uh, say south of the border here, uh, uh, I think uh, it would be possible to get agreement on something which is vastly more radical than, uh, than agreeing on, on uh, not going over the fiscal cliff. Uh, so so uh, I, I think one, one needs, I'm not saying that this would be a picnic, it certainly wouldn't, uh, but, uh, but I think uh, one, one has to think about it in that light. I'm going to go to Gordon for, for an observation on this, but before I do, I just want to tell uh, people in the audience that your mics are now, or the, your, the floor is now open, so if you want to add a comment or ask a question, uh, please uh, queue, put your, uh, put your table in the queue, please. Thanks. Gordon. Well, you just made the point I wanted to make, uh, and made it more eloquently than I, I probably could. Once you are in serious crisis, then the capacity to pull together the series of options and respond to them just increases enormously. A lot of the political constraints start to disappear. I mean, what was done in the autumn of 2008 and the spring of 2009 tells you, and the capacity to do things, the kind of constraints that one feels are there now, I think, really do diminish. And the capacity to do whatever it takes to stop a, a European crisis from turning into a world crisis. I mean, I think we can rule those off the table. It doesn't mean it's going to be pretty or anything like that, but I don't think we have to say that the possibility is the Great Depression. Great. Thanks. Oh, John, you want a two-hander? And then just, after, after that, we'll go to the audience. John. Let me just add that uh, one of the things that would be one hopes would be po become possible uh, in a crisis would be uh, to repair the democratic deficit in Europe, to have the uh, a European elected parliament and president who would take control. <clears throat> that should not be ruled out, and therefore, in a, probably only in a crisis, one would get that step. But uh, that there is wouldn't necessarily be a contradiction, therefore, between. Uh, uh, c continued uh, uh, control of a crisis and uh, a continued democratic deficit. Great, thank you very much. All right, um, let's move to the third phase of this discussion and open it up to the audience, starting with table four. You go ahead. Th there's two of us on this mic, but Mr. Martin's going first. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would be killed by the whole audience if I went first. Um, so, Nairi Woods, um, I think I'm interested in having the panel say something about what I think is a really big disconnect between the way that officials and academics are viewing the legacy of the crisis and, as it were, the facts on the ground. And I think we see that most clearly in Europe. Um, Stephen Pickford has um, given us the official view of Europe, which is heading towards a banking union, which has a European Central Bank putting in place the OMT and the ESM. But on the other side of the coin is what Mario Draghi said two days ago, which is that the European banking system has fragmented and renationalized. In other words, that one of the legacies of this crisis in the European Union is deglobalization of finance, and that calls for a very different kind of governance. And so in the European Union, you get this rather curious set of facts on the ground, which are about a renationalization of banking systems, which, by the way, will make a breakup of the Eurozone less costly, still enormously costly, but less costly over time as that process continues. And the officials who are heading towards the dream of a coherent banking union, even as the facts on the ground have changed in the opposite direction. And I just wonder if that is true globally, 
and what the panel think of that, because I think there is evidence of deglobalization at the international level, and that suggests that rather than exhorting the G20 to be aiming to regulate this global financial system, maybe we need to ask a different question, which is what, what is the governance required of a very different deglobalized financial system? Thanks. Neri, did you, you wanted the panel or, to address that? Well, I think Ms. No. Martin has a question. Oh. You want the second? Let's, let's take, uh, I guess, and, and um, we'll have, I think, three questions from table four, and then we'll go around, and then we'll go to the next table. Well, I, um, I very much agree with Gordon Thiessen on, on, on the concept that the, that the financial crisis is, sim yeah. No, but occasionally you are right. The, the <laughs> very occasionally. The, um, uh, the, 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 the financial crisis uh, simply provides uh, both the, the Europeans, the Eurozone, and the United States with cover for the mess that they're in. On the other hand, I have some difficulty with your, your statement that while we can't do coordination, we can do cooperation. And the, my question really is, uh, does that cooperation, is that g g simply going to be an ephemeral term or is it going to have to be institutionalized? And let me put that in context. Um, at, the, at the time uh, that the, the euro was created, um, there were the, the G7 finance ministers uh, met, you, you would remember this, Gordon, the G7 finance ministers met, and while the French and the Germans were lauding uh, this tremendous creation, uh, the fact is that the United States, Canada, and to a lesser extent, if I remember, Japan at the G7 meeting, essentially posed the question, how can you have a monetary union without the institutions that will make it work? And the answer, of course, was we can't create those institutions because our people would never give up the sovereignty uh, that would be required to do that. But if I remember that discussion, that G7 finance minister's meeting, it was very much, this isn't going to work. Uh, and so it's not true to say that this all was a, a, a discovery 10, 15 years later. The fact is there was a lot of debate at the time that what they were doing essentially said that it was not going to work. Um, but none, nonetheless, we allowed the Europeans to get away with simply saying, well, that's fine, uh, you know, political will is going to carry through. And the really important question that was never asked is not that you're making, only making a mess for yourselves, but that you're going to make a mess for the rest of us in terms of what's going to happen to the global economy. In that context, I'd like to understand how cooperation would work and could cooperation work if it was not institutionalized. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. And Jose Antonio? Yeah, I, I would like the panel to reflect more uh, on the emerging economies. I mean, only uh, Mark uh, made a point. Uh, and uh, le let me uh, uh, pose in particular the questions on China. And the uh, assumption uh, uh, seems to be, uh, I guess, on the table that China is going to continue growing fast. Uh, let's say at the rate of seven, eight percent, uh, like most people project. I mean, how about if China doesn't? Uh, are there not uh, sufficient structural problems in the Chinese economy uh, uh, to uh, uh, that you know will face uh, uh, more, you know, could face more significant problems? I mean, in this transition of leadership, uh, one of the more outstanding issues is the lack of decisions. And, and which may reflect a broader problem that they, they really think they have much less alternatives uh, than, uh, than they have. Now, uh, China is, uh, I think, crucial uh, because it's by far the most important determinant of commodity markets in the world. And the, you, know, you see the world, you know, it is commodity producers that have you know, performed relatively well, including the industrial country commodity producers like Canada. Uh, uh, but it's also Australia, it's New Zealand, uh, I mean, go around, uh, uh, it's Norway. <laughs> so the, if, uh, and not to say, you know, South America or Africa or, you know, the Middle East, you know, uh, which are all commodity producers. So, so if China, you know, on, you know uh, uh, falls significantly in terms of growth, there might be a major disruption in commodity markets that have worldwide implications. Great, thanks very much. Um, 
so very quickly, I mean, Neri has asked about the disconnect between official and academics and, and the, the deglobalization of finance in Europe. And I, to that, I would add not only in Europe. I mean, one of the responses to quantitative easing has been the imposition of capital controls, prudential capital controls in many emerging markets, um, rather than allowing exchange rates to appreciate, for example. Uh, Mr. Martin's talked about the need to ins institutionalize, institutionalize cooperation and then the, the focus uh, of Jose Antonio on, on China and commodity markets. So, um, who wants to start addressing any or all of those? Stephen. Um, I'll try and be brief. Firstly, on Nairi's point, I've never, I, I, I take a slightly jaundiced view of banking union. I don't see it as, as primarily aimed at completing the, um, the single market in financial services, um, which as you say, has, has the banking has become renationalized, which is a real problem for the Eastern European states because they didn't have their own banks. Uh, they've been, they were relying on the French, German, Austrian, Swedish banks to uh, provide banking services. So, so that's a real problem for them. Um, but it seems to me that the underlying rationale for banking union is to find a way around the fiscal uh, coordination problem. Um, you know, the crisis, if, if it fully realizes, will come through a sovereign debt crisis triggering another wave of financial crisis. And that's, that's when the costs get put onto national budgets. Uh, banking union is a way of finding a, a, a pooling of that fiscal cost. Um, so I think it's, um, I think that that's what's, dr that's the, the tail that's driving the dog uh, in that sense. John? Great, thanks Stephen. Gordon, do you want to uh, tackle Mr. Martin's comment? Um, well, I think Paul at the time, a lot of us thought that there was going to be more fiscal discipline than there turned out to be. I mean, there was the Maastricht Treaty, the 3% rules, and you, you had the sense that they understood that the fiscal, fiscal problems could drive them into difficulty. But they understood that, and that would be dealt with. Sadly, that turned out not to be true. And uh, I mean, that tells you that you can't make this work over a long term just on the grounds of voluntary commitment to discipline. And so that you obviously do have to have some central uh, institutions that uh, ensure that that's going to happen. I don't think there's any, there's any way around all of that. But I wasn't sure, Paul, whether you wanted to talk more generally about international cooperation in there, because a lot of this stuff really is, in a sense, domestic. I mean, Europe is a domestic European problem. And the, at the G20, one can say over and over again, you guys have got to sort this out. But it is a domestic European problem, and they have to fix it. And now, it is true that if they don't fix it, that there's a spillover to the rest of the world. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the world can somehow make the, the Europeans fix this problem. They have to fix it. He wants a two-hander. Clearly, is not only a. Is it Can we get the, the mic for table okay. four? Uh, it is clearly not only a domestic European problem because the effects on Canada, the effects on China, as an example, and certainly the effects on the United States are huge. As is the fiscal cliff, a, a global a global problem. And so the question really is. Um, you, no, you no longer have, yes, we understand the domestic aspect of it, and we understand who votes governments in, but the fundamental issue is when, when a major economy creates a massive problem for itself, it creates a massive problem for us. And does there not some kind have to be some kind of institutional cooperation that prevents you from going to hell and dragging me with you? Ideally, yes. In reality, probably not. I'm going to exercise the prerogative of the chair and put my two cents <laughs> to get, get in between these two. I mean, in some respects, I think you could argue that the situation we're facing today is very similar to the situation at the end of the Second World War. I mean, obviously, the, the, the origins of the problem are vastly different. 
but you had governments with very large fiscal debt uh, burdens. You had uh, the challenge of moving demobilized infantrymen back to productive civilian lives. You had the threat of a relapse to global economic stagnation hanging over, over the policy discussions. And there was institutionalized cooperation. I mean, that's a, a system of fixed exchange rates is a system of institutionalized cooperation. Now, I'm not advocating a return to Bretton Woods. I don't think that's practical. I don't think it's desirable. But I think there is historical precedent. The difference today is that in 1945, or 44, when the Bretton Woods Conference was held, there was a clear global hegemon, and there was no question about it. And that leadership, uh, that leader that provided the leadership necessary to bring the others together in around a table and hammer out a deal. And so, apropos your, your question, Mr. Martin, what are, the, what are the possibilities of institutionalizing cooperation? I don't know. Uh, because arguably we don't have that same degree of leadership that, that Keynes and Harry Dexter White provided in 1944. But Jim, what we can do in crisis, as in 2008, 2009, you can get cooperation. The problem really is that as those dysfunctional policies are being implemented, it's very, very difficult to get the world to somehow prevent them from happening. You can get cooperation after the fact. Getting cooperation before the fact to prevent those things from happening, that is what is really difficult. Um, yeah, it seems to me that uh, with, in the absence of a hegemon, which Jim rightly points out, uh, you are in a world where um, you are trying to find softer ways of persuading countries to do the right thing. Uh, and those are, it, it helps if doing the right thing is the right thing both for the country itself and for the rest of the world. Uh, it isn't always the case, although the US used to argue that it was in their case. Um, uh, but uh, so, so you're into mechanisms such as peer pressure, naming and shaming, these softer forms which um, you hope work, but I, I, can't see, um, I, I can't see having formal structures in place which are going to um, uh, impinge on national sovereignty in this respect. Can I, can I just say one more thing about China, because Jose Antonio has raised a very important issue here. I kind of also see this as mainly a national problem. Um, you're right that if China slows down, um, the rest of the world suffers to some extent through trade linkages, um, uh, although actually you know, many countries would welcome uh, having a slightly better balance of payments position as a result. Um, and also, uh, they quite like to have lower commodity prices if they don't produce them themselves. Um, uh, but, and, and on balance, it's probably a good thing for the world economy that commodity prices are lower. The problem for, is for China, where you've got an implicit social contract in place. You know, the Communist Party will deliver growth uh, and increases in living standards. If it can't do that, then I think there's some huge uh, economic and political implications for China itself. Mark, I'm going to turn to you quickly to, uh, to address Jose Antonio, Antonio's uh, comments as well, and then we'll go to table 12. Um, yeah, you, uh, you won't be surprised that I agree with you. I think it, it's probably one of the most profound questions that we're now facing, arguably even more profound than what's happening with the Eurozone, is what's, what's the real story with emerging market growth? Um, you know, not that long ago, it was all about convergence, catch-up was the future. You know, pretty much every forecast out there was saying, you know, not just China, but across a whole swathe of emerging markets, sustained period of outperformance, convergence in GDP per head. Um, the, as I say, the G20 was sort of this concrete manifestation of that. It's interesting, however, the last year in particular, we're starting to question that a bit more. And once you pick at the threads, I think you're right. I mean, if you had a radically changed forecast for China, 
than an awful lot of the other economies, including developed economies like Australia and Canada, which have done very well out of the commodity boom, but large swathes of Latin America, an awful lot of the African growth miracle um, rest on what's been happening with the commodity cycle. If you radically change that, you have a very different view about what the world economy looks like. So you have to think quite hard, I think, about what's happening with Chinese potential growth. Um, do we know? I mean, I think the honest, honest answer is we don't. I mean, I think you know, the, the best guess th that we have, I think, is that we, we are seeing a shift in potential growth rates, that you know, when we're probably double-digit era is gone, and we're now down to something that's lower than that, um, and the numbers that are bounced around are 7 to 9%. Um, I think if that's right, and we're in the 7 to 9% range, and I think if you just do simple, you know, very simple back of the envelope, calculations on potential growth rates and don't worry about all of the, the socio-political complexities, 7 to 9% seems plausible to me. Um, that's operating now in a much bigger Chinese economy. That's still going to be enough to make things look reasonably okay in the rest of the world and the story's intact. If you get something that's much softer than that, um, then I think things look very different. And we do start to rethink about our views for, for the world economy, in particular this fundamental one about, you know, we, we've had this story for a while. In, in Australia, we've talked about it a lot, about a fundamental change in relative prices in the world economy. In other words, in a world economy where a lot of what used to be the world's poorer people are urbanizing and industrializing at a rapid rate, you know, that's a world economy where the relative price of resources is higher. Um, if you pull that story away, then you, you, you live in a world economy where the relative price looks quite different. And, you know, as you said, for big resource importers, that's maybe good news. For those of us who are commodity exporters, much less so. Great. Thanks. Quick uh, observation from your... Well, just, just a footnote on what uh, Gordon and uh, Stephen have said uh, concerning European or your area fiscal policy. I think uh, Stephen emphasized the role of the fiscal compact uh, going forward as, as a disciplining device. Uh, Gordon mentioned uh, uh, the role of uh, actually some, some joint or common decision making uh, going forward. Uh, I think the point is that uh, you may achieve agreement on these things because going forward you don't know who they are going to hit. But there's another problem that needs to be solved in Europe, and that's legacy debt. And, and the difficulty with legacy debt is that you know exactly who it is that you redistribute in favor of and away from. Yeah. Okay, uh, table 12, please. Um, I don't know if any of my fellow uh, table members want to say something, but I press the button first. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so three quick, uh, three quick questions slash comments on on Europe. Uh, would the panel uh, perhaps elaborate a little bit more on the nature of European risk? Uh, the focus for the past year has been on immediate tail risks, but the discussion suggests that what's really around the corner may be the tail is getting fatter rather than thinner, uh, and the question is why. Uh, so one aspect we heard from Stephen is the perverse or the vicious interaction between the sovereign balance sheet and the banking balance sheet. Another aspect which hasn't been mentioned is the potential for France to become a Spain or an Italy. Uh, a third aspect is the perverse impact of growth in, in some sense, uh, uh, aggravating uh, the creditworthiness aspect with just a period of long growth. So I'd like to, if maybe some speculation. Second, on the fiscal cliff issue. So the immediate risk is fiscal cliff, but as we all well know, the longer term, term challenges of getting fiscal adjustment, credible fiscal adjustment in the US, nobody has mentioned Japan. Uh, and I would like to maybe have some speculation on the Japanese uh, thing. Third, on the emerging market issue, as Jose Antonio pointed out, in the G20 discussions, uh, there has been prolonged discussion on rebalancing. But what Mark, I think, very, in my view, very correctly emphasized, the issue is not rebalancing, but perhaps the level of growth in emerging markets. I think, in fact, the rebalancing in China has taken place, and in the other major emerging markets, except for Russia, they're really deficit countries already. And they have limits on how far they can go. So the question is really a level of growth issue rather than a rebalancing. And I just wanted to, to highlight that if people agree with it. Jack. 
have a mic? Thank you. Uh, let me go to Gordon's interesting question. How do you get cooperation before the fact? Uh, I will si sound a little bit naive, I guess, suppose, if I say you can try to do it through better surveillance. Whether that surveillance takes place in the context of the G20, which I wouldn't favor, or it takes place in a reinvigorated IMF, which I would favor. Uh, and there's a ways of bringing that together that I'll talk about a little bit this afternoon. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, quickly, the surveillance, the content of surveillance has to be far more specific than it has been. And the content of comment, public comment, by groups like the G20 has to be much more forthcoming than it has been. The protection that exists, the peer protection that exists within those groups and indeed within the IMF as well, has to change. How do you do that? I think you do it by getting the surveillance content more specific. One of the things we did in a, something called the Emerging Markets Forum that Paul knows about is to construct an index of resilience. And we did it first for the emerging market countries. In this latest round, we did it as well for the European countries. Our data only goes back to 1997. But this resilience index shows the resilience of Greece, Italy, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, in a virtual monotonic decline since 1997, since the beginning of the data that we have available. If there's more focus on that kind of thing, that's a 14, that's a 13, 12 year lead time. Seeing these, the resilience of these countries deteriorate significantly. And you can identify the kinds of policies, domestic policies, uh, that were causing that deterioration. Something like that needs to be done. The other, going to Gordon's other comment, the spillover exercise that's beginning isn't much yet, but it certainly is a way of going to exactly the kind of thing the fund should be making a contribution to, and that is bringing the impact of a given country's policies on the rest of the world and back again. Great. Thanks, Jack. We have table six, three, and 11 with uh, in the queue. I'm closing it after that, and I'm going to ask um, both uh, question, people asking questions and the panel to be very brief and succinct in, in response, just so everyone gets a, gets a chance to, to hear, uh, hear the questions that are on the table. Um, maybe we'll go to table six and then uh, ask for responses. So table six. Yeah. You, Lourdes. Uh, hello, I'm Lourdes Aranda. Uh, I will be very brief. Uh, my experience from the last year is that uh, as much as I share with, with Paul the idea that this has to have a cooperation basis and that we have to work together, uh, there's a complete reluctance from the Europeans to accept the spillover effect of the Euro crisis in other countries. I mean, they just are very, very on the defensive. They don't want to talk about it. And they say, it's our problem. This is not to be deal dealt in the G20. And as much as we tell them, yes, but we show them the facts, how, what is happening, how it's affecting the emerging markets and exchange rates and, and trade. And uh, they, they say it's an internal problem. So that's when really you say, what was the G24? I mean, the idea uh, in 2008 is let's cooperate and work out of this together. But if, if, there you are, if you are in denial, it's very hard to do it. So uh, we are very much involved in domestic issues, uh, the German elections. Uh, so, they, I mean, they, they're very, very on the defensive. And then the, about the idea of China maybe coming to the rescue, uh, I do see China uh, very reluctant to get involved in these issues. So um, I think some of the suggestions are, are valid. We have a lack of leadership. And I think we started the G20 with this uh, spirit de corp. Everybody wanted to get out of the crisis and let's work together. And unfortunately, we've lost it in the way. And, and it's unfortunately because I don't, I don't believe we have gotten out of the crisis from 2008. We're still very much in the middle. And, and I don't know how we are going to get out of it. I'm, I'm comfortable that uh, with the U.S. election, the, the, I mean, President Obama has been involved in the process. Uh, my, my opinion is that he's a little bit fed up of it. But that, I mean, this is what we have, the G20, and we have to work with it. So I hope uh, we can go back to the initial spirit. Great. Thank you. Um, Tom or Colin? Someone else? Thank you very much. A spectacular start for this uh, several days of discussions. So hats off to all six of you for doing that. 
Um, I wanted to go back to uh, the juxtaposition of John Williamson's comment that re rebalancing is ideally suited for the G20 and Gordon Thyssen's comment that don't hold your breath that coordination can take place under the G20. And I would like to address myself to the responsibility and implications of all this discussion for ourselves, for the think tanks that are in the room, um, and our relationships with each other. I mean, I think, just quickly, that one of the unique things that has happened in, since 2008 is that for the first time, global summitry has evolved with a consistent group of think tanks continuously involved with the G20, namely all of us in this room and others. We have had access, we've had influence, and we have voice. And it has been beneficial, I think, as a bridge between civil society and the officials. But I think we have to, what I would like to suggest is we have to ask more of ourselves now. We have to ask ourselves, shouldn't we toughen up our game? Shouldn't we try harder to, to serve not only as a bridge, but as an accountability mechanism for the G20? And shouldn't we, since we know about these issues, press harder to make them happen? So we know enough about rebalancing, for example, to be realistic enough to hold Gordon's position. But since we know how important it is to the rest of the world and to our own countries, that rebalancing is essential, that there are answers, that don't we need to put some fire under ourselves, work together to come up with surveillance of the surveillance, if you like, so that we're holding that process feet to the fire to deliver what is admittedly a hugely difficult outcome of coordinated outcomes. So I'm gonna raise this again throughout our days here, but I just wanted to sort of throw this out on the table. George. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to follow um, that idea because um, I first asked for the floor. It turned out I was not familiar with the technique, so I only pressed it after. Uh, Tom, thanks for um, helping me on that. Uh, uh, you know, picturing Europe or any other country or situation in the world as damned if I do, damned if I don't, don't like that. So, you know, the dismal science is something we all practice, but we do want to see a way out. And uh, I understand the difficulties in Europe. I uh, still say I signed the Maastricht Treaty, and I don't regret it, because there's issues where you need more Europe. They have been pointed out. What has been less clear is better Europe, better functioning. In this regard, the statement by Jürgen, I think, was very appropriate because it shows both the need and the difficulty to have a narrative of structural reforms. Uh, Mario Monti, for example, when he was commissioner on the internal market, tried. Nobody could see, understand, you, you, you see the 3%, you see the 10%, you don't see how to do that narrative. Now that's worked for surveillance. So I come in defense of the naming and faming and shaming of the Wim Kok report. I come in defense of peer pressure. I come in defense of surveillance and what Borman said. I think that's very appropriate. This idea of surveillance of surveillance makes me, makes me dream. What, what would that be like? But it's a good idea. And lastly, uh, in honor of heroes past, uh, Triffin was already mentioned yesterday. Today, Purvis, whom I really liked, was also mentioned. What can we understand from the history? I, I wouldn't compare with Bretton Woods much too much. There was a problem, and Paul Martin alluded to this, that the Europeans wanted to do it alone, and at the same time see, look, we're doing it alone. Trifin pointed to that. Trifin, when he was developing the dilemma of the gold exchange standard, also was promoting European integration. The fact of the matter is that Europe did it a little bit alone and now doesn't want to be blamed for that. Okay, we address that problem. They are still different countries. And the single market is partly threatened by the banking union. It's a very technical issue. We don't have uh, time to go into it, but there are really two sides. One is banking and sovereign risk. 
That's one side, doesn't have to do with the single market. But then there is a dimension of the single market. Again, Monty uh, saw that. So this is a defense of uh, the Europeans. Um, they are bad, but hey, so is everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, let's go to table 11. We'll take and then I'm, I'll close the floor. Uh, we'll have a quick round uh, from the panelists. Um, there's a lot already on the table, but I think it's probably just to ensure that uh, people that want to speak get a chance to speak. So table 11, please. Okay. Thank you. I'm Memdu Karakulukcu from Istanbul, Turkey. I may be rephrasing the rebalancing growth point, but let me have a go at it. I mean, we think the global imbalances is the underlying problem. And when I think about global imbalances, I think about really integrating large population segments into, in Asia, into the global trading system. I think that's what we've been struggling with for a few decades now. And I think in my mind, reserve accumulation is the knob which we use to adjust the pace of that integration that Chinese authorities especially have been using very effectively. And finance, it seems, allowed the high pace of that absorption to be absorbed for a longer period than that was possible. So if that's roughly, at least that's in my mind, roughly the story, my question is, where we are, is this about really taking care of accumulated costs and burdens of absorbing hundreds of millions into the global trading system? Or are we talking about a continuing pressure coming from India, from Africa, uh, prospectively, of bringing more people into the trading system, because that's, that will make a huge difference. If it's about dealing with accumulated costs, I think we can muddle through. But if it's a sustained force that's continuing, then the global trading system simply may not sustain it. We may not have that absorption capacity. So that would be my question. Right, well, we ha certainly have a, a very, uh wide range of, of questions and comments, and I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure where to begin. Uh, <laughs> but let's, let's try and, and pick up, uh, start with Amar's uh, three quick uh, hits here. We've got Europe, what are the real risks? The U.S. fiscal cliff, everyone talks about the U.S. cliff, but what about Japan? And uh, where do the emerging markets play in in all of this? Who wants to, to pick those up quickly? John? Well, let me try uh, two of them at any rate, the last two. Um, I, I don't think the tail, tail risks are increasing. I think that uh, in Europe, uh, for, sorry, I'm going to comment on all three, I guess. Um, it seems to me that uh, the risks have increased and uh, the risks of uh, the goods outcome have also increased. And so it's not just tail risks that have increased. We used to think of Europe as a stable area and we don't any longer. And I think that's uh, uh, a, uh, a serious worry. Uh, secondly, on Japan, uh, once again, I think it, of it as a, uh, a muddle through scenario seems to me to be the, by far the most likely, and indeed, the, it could be worse. Uh, the third, uh, on the rebalancing issue, uh, here I uh, also take on board uh, Colin. I, I think, incidentally, uh, apropos the last remark, I think that rebalancing means essentially uh, shifting demand away from those who've been running large surpluses towards the advanced countries which have been at large deficits. I don't see it as the same as uh, uh, absorbing new workers into the world labor force. I think that's also a problem, but it's a much more manageable problem. I don't see it as a similar sort of problem. Um, for, for China, I don't think the rebalancing process is complete. I accept your point on, well, at least two of the other uh, picks. Um, but uh, in the case of China, they, they still have a surplus. It's still large, it's forecast to get larger, and, and that's uh, with an underlying capital inflow, the long-term capital inflow is still into China. And so I really don't see that problem has been resolved um, as yet. Great, thanks very much, John. Uh, Jorgen? Let me uh, just return on, on the Japan point uh, and start with a very brief, I promise you, uh, anecdote. Uh, which is that uh, when uh, house prices rose throughout the OECD area uh, all the way uh, through the uh, 
uh, 2000s, uh, we, we kept warning about these increases in, in house prices, and yet they continued increasing. And eventually, we sort of had a fair bit of, of self-doubt. Uh, were, were, were our models actually wrong? Uh, and I remember even having been on the receiving end of some snide remarks from Stephen at, at, at the time. <laughs> uh, but but, but be, be, be that as, as it may, as it may uh, we then uh, actually toned down our warnings on the house prices just about the time when, 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 when they were uh, collapsing. Uh, now, on Japan, we have been warning about the Japan situation for quite a while. Uh, nothing has happened. Uh, I think, uh, given the parallel with, with the uh, housing market, we probably should continue uh, warning about Japan. Uh, but, but there's one thing about uh, Japan that I, I think is worth keeping in mind. They start with a low tax pressure, and, and, and that actually does make things a little bit easier. But still, I agree the challenges are daunting. Yeah, to, on, on Japan, I mean, the, it's often cited that you know, it's debt owed to themselves. But to, to use a Bill White, to, to invoke a Bill Whiteism, it, it is until it isn't, in which case, I mean, there's, unless they impose capital controls at some point, people that want to hold another asset will hold another asset. Uh, Stephen, do you want to pick up some of these questions? Uh, only very briefly. And on Japan, um, we, I guess we all warned that 150% uh, debt to GDP ratio was a problem, and then 180 was an even bigger problem. It's now 250. Um, you do tend, you do kind of start to worry if the crisis that you're predicting doesn't happen. But I think Jürgen's right. Um, you need to keep working keep warning about that because uh, at some point uncomfortable f fiscal arithmetic does bite. On the European issues that Amar raised, I, it seems to me that they are actually pretty much all interrelated. Uh, I, think it's, um, I think it's wrong to try to um, tease out the different, uh, the different risks because I think um, ultimately it's, it's a system problem. Uh, and whether things pop up as fiscal problems or financial problems or regulatory issues or um, uh, creditworthiness issues, they're all kind of part of the same problem. Thanks, Stephen. Mark, do you want to tackle these? Um, yeah, I'll pick up on Amar's uh, points. I mean, I think, yeah, two of them. I mean, the, f the first one, which, which I think is important to remember is yeah, emerging markets do differ, and there are plenty of emerging markets that are, that are deficit countries, not, not just surplus countries. Um, so you've got to be careful when you're talking about rebalancing. And I think linked to that, and it, it, it's one of the points that I made in my original five minutes, is that many emerging market policymakers continue to worry about volatile capital flows, dangers of sudden stops, th those kinds of issues, and hence the attractions of self-insurance and reserve accumulation you know, are, are going to continue to be there. On China, where, they're, you know, where they have more than enough <laughs> reserves in terms of self-insurance and, and, and then some. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say China is rebalancing. I mean, I think the, the policy shift that we're seeing, and in particular the change in growth rates, is part of that process. And I think that it's important not to underestimate how difficult that that potentially is. Um, that you're change, you, know, you are changing what was a very successful growth model and you're doing it at a time when you, you have to do it because the rest of the world has changed around you, but you're doing it at a time when the rest of the world looks extremely volatile and in an extremely risky place. And there are plenty of domestic challenges for China trying to do that rebalancing. So um, I don't think we should be surprised that they're doing it cautiously and slowly and at times falteringly. And actually, we should probably applaud the caution because the last thing that the world economy needs right now is something to go badly wrong in China. So a, a cautious policy rebalancing is actually not a bad thing for all of us. Uh, Gordon, if you want, I'm not. I'm not. I, just, I just wanted to uh, say that the notion of think tanks supporting the kind of analysis that the IMF could be doing, to whether it's name or shame, whatever. I think that is all helpful. I, while I'm very uh, skeptical about real 
coordination, the notion that those issues are out there. And it's not just a fund, it's somebody else as well supporting all of that. I think that's, that's good and that's potentially helpful. And it should make Paul Martin feel better. <laughs> Uh, let me just pick up on uh, a couple of things that Amar said. One on the European question. And I think, um, to me, the real risk, the real danger from Europe is, is really another post-Lehman kind of environment. And I think what made Lehman so, so damaging, so destructive, was um, Akerlof's market for lemons. That suddenly you had a whole lot of institutions that were holding a whole lot of paper and they suddenly woke up and, and you know, the managers, the portfolios managers woke up and they said one day and said, I don't know what I'm holding. And of course, if you don't know what you're holding, you don't know what somebody else is holding. And that led to the complete freeze up, the complete seizure of the financial system. You, and of course, because it was centered in the United States, that is, that is why it was truly a global systemic problem. I think, the, to me, the, the real worry about Europe is not that, not the same, but it's very similar to that in the sense that I worry that someday people will wake up and say, I don't know what the euro is. And because there are millions, billions, trillions of contracts denominated in euros, if that day happens and people suddenly wake up and say, I really don't know whether the euro is going to survive, whether it survives in what form, um, that is, to me, that's the real nightmare scenario. Because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to some extent, we've shot the bolt on, on doing extraordinary measures post-Lehman. And do we have room to do more in a, in a similar circumstance? I don't know. Um, Lourdes, I'm actually more optimistic about the G20 than you are, and I'm actually, um, I, I, I was at Los Cabos for, for CG, and I thought, to me, that was, a re, that was a defining moment, because for the first time in international policy discussions, you had not just one, but several advanced emerging G7 countries being singled out and pressured, and, and I wasn't in the room, Rob was in the room, um, but it was clear to everyone that Europe was under the microscope and Europe was getting a lecture, and Europe responded. I mean, you could argue that the response wasn't sufficient, it hasn't been timely enough, and so on and so forth, but you look at what Mario Draghi has done following Los Cabos, you look at the discussions in terms of uh, banking union and so on. So. It's not, it, it doesn't work immediately, and, and the, the direct impacts may not be uh, immediately discernible. But I'm actually slightly more optimistic about G20. Finally, on the, the, the question from Table 11 and the integration of India, Brazil, and so on, I, I, think, I think this is a, I agree. I mean, this is, this is a huge issue, uh, and one that unfortunately I don't think we uh, collectively around this table ha have explored. But, you know, going back, pre-crisis, um, I think the integration of China really did help create an environment of uh, perhaps, what, what, is a, what is a good, good uh, description of, it lulled people into a false sense of complacency. Because what was happening with China was uh, deflationary pressures coming from China with a bunch of inflation targeting central banks in the advanced economy saying, we don't have a problem because look at our inflation. Um, and we know how, the, how that story ended. And again, I know Gordon is going to want to, <laughs> want to hit me after this. <laughs> but but I, I think you know, the fact that we are trying to integrate or that we are integrating uh, very large economies into the global, into the global uh, system uh, really uh, behooves us to, to look at the policy frameworks that we're looking at the, at the national level. Anyway, not a very satisfactory response, I admit. My only role now is to thank the members of the panel. Uh, I think we've had a very good discussion. Um, I, I am not going to attempt to sum up <laughs> because I don't know where to begin. Let me just go back to something that Jürgen said, however, and, and I think he was phrasing it, and, and Stephen picked it up, and I think everyone uh, mentioned uh, mentioned this or alluded to this in one way or another, and that is the issue of rules. 
right? As I, as I started off, we are looking at a future of very large, very difficult adjustment burdens around the world. And policy rules help policymakers adhere to a difficult path. The danger is that the rules themselves can come back to bite you, and I think that's what we're seeing in Europe. And so the, the challenge, I think, uh, going forward will be to try and ensure that we have the right rules with the right escape clauses so that when you come to these, uh, when you experience large shocks, you have a response that is sufficiently flexible that you don't end up in a situation that Europe is unfortunately in today, where essentially the full burden of adjustment is through internal, quote unquote, to use, to use a, uh, the, the metaphor, you know, through internal devaluation, which of course means pushing down wages to restore, regain competitiveness. But to do that, you've got to drive unemployment up. And Jorgen will no, no doubt say structural reforms can help in that process, and I agree. But uh, I think, you know, we're, we're looking at a world where we have very large adjustment burdens, they have to be shared. Uh, in the very broadest possible terms, and we have to have very forward-looking policymakers. So that's the challenge. That's, I think we've, we've addressed that, and I thank you all, and I thank members of the audience for the, uh, for the questions and the comments. We have gone over time. I've been instructed to say that the next session begins at 11 o'clock, and if I can ask you to join in a round of applause for the panelists. Thanks very much.